In the beginning, God created a perfect world with humanity as its keeper. But in the midst of Eden, the enemy, the ancient serpent, gave Adam an alternative. Reject God's plan and make your own way. In doing so, humanity fell, bringing chaos, murder, destruction, and death. But God made a promise that through the seed of woman, the serpent would be overcome. Jesus, born into a world of sin to overcome the very world we never could. Jesus has shown himself triumphant over all things. Good morning. I got new glasses this week. Can you tell? Turns out I haven't had an eye appointment in over four years. Uh, and I learned a lot when I went to the eye appointment. I learned that my eyes are healthy, although I'm blind as a bat. And uh, as I did some research on how your eye even works, I learned that your eyes, the way that you see, the ability for you to see at all has everything to do with light. If there was no light, you couldn't see. You may know that when you're in the dark, even though your pupils may dilate, you still have not enough light in the room to actually give any ability for your eyes to see anything in front of you. Uh, but it's also true that if your eyes don't function in a way to bring light in, to transmit it to your brain, uh, then for it to transmit from your brain, flip the image and be out in front of you, which is, allows you to see the people in front of you or whatever you're looking at, uh, the problem is if you don't have a light, you don't see. As a matter of fact, we need to think about that when it comes to our faith, when it comes to what it means to be a Christian, is if there is no light, you don't see the truth. If you're in darkness, you have no ability to have light or to respond to the light. And in the text this morning, we're going to see all about how uh, the world that people lived in great darkness and how it took light to be shown in that darkness for people to be able to know the light and to respond to the light. You see, in short, when we look at this text in Matthew 4, 12 through 17, you can turn there already with me in your Bible or on your laptop or on your, your iPad or tablet if you haven't already. What we need to understand is that Jesus, as he came here, even as we see on the video before I come up here, uh, we see that there is a darkness that it transcends uh, humanity, that covers the earth in darkness, and without there being a solution to the problem, you and I, we are out of luck. You and I have no way, no ability to come to know the light, and which makes it that much more important that Jesus came to conquer the depths of human depravity. That is, the darkness that cloaks humanity that we could not see out of because there was no light for you and I to have any other ability to move out of that darkness. And that Christ came to conquer that, to conquer Satan, to conquer sin uh, on our behalf and to give light and to give life to everyone who would, as we see in the text, would turn from their sin and place their trust in Christ for salvation and that's the point that Matthew makes here. If you look at the text, starting in verse 12, and I'll ask again for the tech team to continue dialing this in. There's a little bit of a hum. Maybe turn my volume down a little bit as well. It'll take a couple of weeks to get this uh, sound system dialed in. There we go. You see, the, the apostle Matthew is transitioning, if you remember last week, uh, where he was in his recount of Jesus' ministry. They were down at the Dead Sea. But now in the next verse, he's no longer at the Dead Sea. He's at the Sea of Galilee. He's in Capernaum. That's quite a distance. And you see Matthew transitioning from Jesus in the southern wilderness, being baptized, and then being in the wilderness to be tempted. And now he begins his ministry in the northern region of Galilee. So pick up with me there in verse 12 as we look at how Jesus began his preaching ministry. It says, now when he heard that John, that is John the Baptist, so we've been talking about him for the last month, as John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. It's important at least to note the reason why John the Baptist was arrested. Uh, if you 
uh, know your Bible, you can at least jot down Matthew 14, 3 through 5. Uh, John the Baptist, his whole ministry was about preaching uh, repentance, preaching and telling people, uh, you're in sin and you need to prepare for the Messiah to come. Uh, the importance of this is it wasn't just to the regular old people of the region. He called out everybody's sin from the lowliest to the highest. And in one particular account that we see uh, here in Matthew 14, John the Baptist even had exchanges with Herod the Tetrarch, Herod the, the leader of that region at the time. Not to be confused with Herod the Great, who was the father of Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, but he even confronted Herod. And here's what it says in Matthew 14, 3 through 5. John the Baptist, as he confronted Herod, Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias. Now, Herodias uh, is now married to Herod, but was not Herod's wife. It was his brother's wife. Now, he took his brother's wife and married her, which is adultery, and he was called out on that. But what makes it even worse uh, is Herodias, which you find interesting. Herodias is the feminine of Herod. Uh, Herodias is actually the niece of Herod. And the niece, turns out, of her first husband, Philip. And so not only do you have adultery, you have an incestuous relationship and adultery. And John the Baptist is saying, Repent. You cannot marry her. She is not your wife. Turns out she's actually your niece, and it's Philip's wife anyway. He didn't like that. Because John had said these things, that it's not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put John the Baptist to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet, which he was. And so instead of killing him, he took him, shackled him up, thrown him into prison. And so when this is going on, Jesus withdraws from uh, the wilderness or from the Dead Sea area and the region there from Judea, and he goes up to Galilee. And when he went to Galilee, he, he was in the region of Galilee and leaving Nazareth there in verse 13, and he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Now, footnote, sidebar, uh, we have to understand what the gospel writers are doing uh, because if you know your Gospels well enough, you know the chronology of Matthew is not fitting with some of the other accounts, particularly in the Gospel of John. Because if you understand the Gospel of John, there's actually a lot that happened between the baptism of Jesus down at the Dead Sea uh, and Jesus' early Galilean ministry. There's a lot of things that happened here, and the question is, where is it at? Why isn't Matthew talking about these things? As a matter of fact, I'd like to show you, at least on a map here on the screen, uh, you can see the long distance that Jesus had traveled here from his area in the region of baptism. Uh, it most likely, probably went back to Jerusalem before he took a trip up to Galilee. Uh, if you remember a, a lot of uh, accounts in the book of John, uh, the Samaritan woman, you notice he goes right through Samaria. And so he's, he, that is when you see in John the uh, story of the Samaritan woman, the wedding at Cana, uh, and also Jesus cleansing the temple, which means he actually had to go back to Jerusalem. All of those things happened uh, between the time Jesus was tempted and by the time we see him leaving Nazareth and going to Capernaum. There's a lot of things that we actually don't read in the book of Matthew that happened in between verse uh, 12 of this text and the previous text there in the baptisms. Now, you have to ask then, Why? Why, why is this the case? Well, it's under, when you understand the purpose of the Gospels, the purpose of the Gospels weren't to give you the chronological step-by-step -step, uh, play of everything that happened in Jesus' life. What you need to remember is the Gospel writers had a, had a motive. There was something they were, tr they were doing in the writing of their gospel to show the people who were receiving the gospel what they wanted them to know about Jesus Christ. And you remember... When it comes to Matthew, he is proving to a generally Jewish Christian population and those who were wondering about the, uh, the, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that he was indeed the Son of God, that he was the Messiah to come foretold in the Old Testament, and that he was the King of the Jews. And so his, uh, his purpose wasn't that we lay out everything perfectly chronologically and don't miss anything. The point of Matthew was to say, you need to see why geographically that the Old Testament proves that all these things that Jesus did, he fulfilled them. He was, remember where he was born? Remember where he fleed to when he went to Egypt? Remember that he'd be called a Nazarene? All these things you notice in the book of Matthew, he points all of those things out to show you that even geographically, Jesus is a son of God. Because look at all the places that he went that fulfilled what mostly Isaiah the prophet foretold in the Old Testament. 
And so, as a matter of fact, it's not just Matthew who does these things. Luke had an agenda. Mark had an agenda. John had an agenda. There were things, particular things, they wanted you to see through the life of Jesus that did not necessitate a step-by-step, here's where Jesus went day one, here's where he went day two, here's where he went day three. And as a matter of fact, if there was any gospel writer who wanted to do that, it would have been impossible. And it would have been impossible because of texts like John 21.25. John 21.25 says this, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, where every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written about it. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Like, even everything that we have in the Gospels is still not nearly everything that Jesus did. Like, he was so miraculous. He, was, he showed that he was a son of God and power and authority in so many ways that we could not even fill the world with his books because it would take too many. I mean, when I look at all the great things I've done, I could maybe have a pamphlet, maybe a note card. When it came to Jesus, all the books in the world couldn't fill all the things that he did. And so it was important for all the gospel writers to say, well, there's a lot of things that he did, but what is going to prove the point that we're making in the gospel is that this is the Son of God, that there's people wondering who this Jesus is, and I have to help them see through my eyewitness account of him or through the people's eyewitness account that I'm close to to show them who exactly this man is. So Matthew's doing that, which in his attempt to do that, he doesn't give you every single event that happened in the life of Jesus. That's a sidebar because I think it's important because if you get asked that question, now you know the answer. But I digress, so let's continue. Look at the rest of verse 13. He left Nazareth and he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun in the territory of Naphtali. Now this place is where Jesus began his preaching ministry. In this particular place there, In Galilee was the historic region and the historical allotments in the Old Testament of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, if you remember, when we went through uh, our Old Testament survey in the first chapter of Matthew, when we looked at the genealogy of Jesus Christ and we learned about what was important about the united kingdom and the divided kingdom and the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. All those things are really important because now you need to use those things that we have learned over the past few months. Zebulun and Naphtali, they were tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. And what's important about the northern kingdom of Israel uh, is they were abhorrent and they sinned against God. Uh, They were idolaters Uh, And they did their own thing. They went their own way. And so around 700 B.C., during that time, uh, you have the the country or the nation of Assyria. Assyria comes from the north. They take over the northern kingdom of Israel. And so at this time, you have a lot of chaos. You have a lot of mothers losing their children. You have a lot of families being dispersed and killed. And you have this enemy country coming in and taking over uh, what has historically been the people of God. That's a very dark scenario, isn't it? Imagine America being taken over by forces from the north, and we sit here and we think about how good it was and how bad it is now, and we recognize the point that it was our sin that brought us to this point, that God is judging us, because that's exactly what was happening at that time that God was judging the northern kingdom of Israel for their sin, and he was pronouncing justice on them. And he says, I will turn you back to me uh, because you're living unjustly. You're taking advantage of people, uh, and you don't follow my commands. And so because of that, 721, 722 B.C., you end up having Assyria completely taking over uh, the northern kingdom. Now, this is really, really important uh, when it comes to the location of Jesus' ministry. And we'll look at that in verse 14. So look look at verse 14. So there there in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, this is what the prophet Isaiah said there in verse 14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And here, Matthew is quoting Isaiah 9, 1 through 2, when he says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And it says the people there that were dwelling in great darkness. And this is where you need to know a little bit of your Old Testament context and a little bit of the context in Jesus' day. Simply, 
this, that Galilee, being that historical tribal allotment of Naphtali and of, of Zebulun, it was at the epicenter of this Assyrian invasion. And I mean the epicenter. I'm talking about as, the, as people came from the north into Israel, they came from Damascus and they came down into the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. And that trail led them right beside the Sea of Galilee. So everyone knew, not only as the, uh, as the enemy was coming in and as they were going out, even as they were being dispersed and exiled, they took a road right by the Sea of Galilee. That was a very important route in that time, and that's where everybody came in and came out. And so when the enemy came in, they were taking that place by the Sea of Galilee. And remember, you have to remember, this isn't, woe is me, uh, the innocent people of Israel being taken over by Assyria. You must remember that the reason that northern kingdom of Israel is being taken over was because of their depravity, because of their sin. And God was using Assyria as his conduit for justice being poured out on Israel. And so this was a just consequence for the rebellion of the northern kingdom. Kingdom, And so that's what you see happening here. Their idolatry, their injustice, their breach of God's covenant with them. And therefore Assyrian, Assyria sins on them and takes them over. But that's the Old Testament. So the question we have to ask is why at all is Matthew taking these allotments, taking this geographical area that don't even exist anymore in that name here in the fourth chapter of Matthew. I have one more map for you to look at. If you notice where Jesus is in Galilee, and you look at this map, which is the actual historical allotments of the 12 tribes of Israel, where is Jesus? In the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so the exact same place that Jesus is at in the New Testament was the same place that this prophecy, the same region this prophecy was pointing out. In this place, there is darkness. In this place, there has been historical rebellion against God and a cloak of darkness and depravity that spans from the Old Testament all the way even into the life of Jesus. And so this is the place in particular that Jesus starts his preaching ministry, which is very significant. Because Matthew is setting the stage for another uh, geographical apologetic. And you remember we used that term a few months ago. Matthew is over and over again proving that Jesus is going where the Old Testament proves that the Messiah will go throughout his life. Whether it's where he is born, where he has to flee to, where he returns to, where he was born. Did I say that one already? Uh, Where he is now going to start his ministry. All these places are geographically significant And these geographical locations that he finds himself in are proved by the Old Testament to be exactly what was foretold that the Messiah would do. And so here we are with another one of those geographical apologetics that he is going to this place that is dark. And as Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 says, that God's going to, through the Messiah, bring light to the darkness. And he's going to come into this place and he's going to bring hope where there is hopelessness. He's going to bring joy where there is gloom. So that's what we we see. And then Matthew uses Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 to point out two important truths about this region. One, the utter hopelessness of this region, both in its past, through the Assyrian exile and the sin and depravity of these people, and also uh, the hopelessness of even that region in the present, which we'll get to in a moment. That was the first thing that we see the two important truths, the utter hopelessness of the region. And number two, God's promise to deliver his people from their depravity and from the consequences of their sin. It's exactly what Matthew is is positing here using this quotation. He's saying, yes, there is darkness and depravity and sin, but Jesus has come to bring light to the darkness and to rescue the people from a depraved life and a depraved mind. So at least we understand what's going on historically then, but what about the time of Jesus. Well, during the time of Jesus, you must realize that Galilee was a a bustling region. And the region was very important because you had the Sea of Galilee. There was a giant economy of fishing and trade. Remember that road from Damascus that went down into the area was a major trade route. And so you at least have a a regional headquarters, a place where where people would gather and do trade, uh, which shows you that it's not only a place where Jews would have gathered, 
It's a place where the nations would gather. It's a place where religious syncretism was, was a big deal. People were very open, and people were very uh, interested in other religions and not the God of Israel. As a matter of fact, if you read historical accounts and commentaries, they'll actually say by the time that Jesus got there, and even during the intertestamental period, most groups of Jews left the region because of persecution and danger, and simply because it was an ungodly place to live. And so Jews didn't even like the region of Galilee. R.T. France, a commentator on the book of Matthew, says that this area was a center for regional administration for the Roman Empire. Why is all this important? It's important because you need to see that it wasn't an insignificant place. I mean, this place, as far as its location to Jerusalem, was a a very dark place with a lot of Gentiles, but it wasn't useless. There were people there. There there were things there that were important to God, the souls of people. Uh, And it was a dark place that proved that if God could save people there, God could save people anywhere. And that's exactly, in in the mind of a Jew, what they would have said. If God can save people in Galilee, in Capernaum of all places, he can surely save anybody. So therefore you have Jesus here in this geographical apologetic showing up to a place where only God could bring the light. The point is this, that the region was spiritually bankrupt from the time of the divided kingdom to the time of Jesus. And that's what you really need to see is not how much has changed when it comes to the light of God in that region from the divided kingdom from the time that Assyria took them over until the time that Jesus was there. It was a very depraved, very sinful, and very dark place. But what does that matter for you and me? Well, if you and I, we know our Bible. It really doesn't matter if I'm in Jerusalem, Capernaum, or New Braunfels. The reality is that we are all under a cloak of darkness, and we all live in a world of depravity. You yourself are a depraved human being, separated from the light and the life of God. Even in the life of Jesus, he made it clear that no one was exempt. I mean, if anyone was exempt from depravity, it was going to be who? The religious leaders. It was going to be the people in Jerusalem. It was going to be these people who were devout, practicing Jews waiting for the Messiah to come. If there were anybody who was exempt from the darkness of sin, it was these people. But yet, Jesus spent a bulk of his ministry calling out those exact people. That no one is exempt from recognizing that they are depraved and separated from a holy God. Everyone, whether they were in Jerusalem or Galilee, were spiritually bankrupt. It didn't stop there, and it certainly didn't stop here. Everywhere we go, we realize the toll of the spiritual bankruptcy that we all find ourselves in. And what we need to do, the same thing that Jesus is calling the people to do here in Matthew chapter 4, is that everyone needs to grasp the depths of their depravity. And that's point number one on your outline. I want you to write that down. You need to grasp the depths of your depravity. It's not something you think about. As a matter of fact, you actually try not to think about this, don't you? Uh, You don't like to think of how sinful you really are, how depraved you are, how sinful you are. We don't want to think about these things because it brings sorrow. It brings grief in our lives. But it's the very thing that we must remember, particularly if we want to ever either respond to the gospel or live out a gospel life, it is important for even Christians to recognize the depths of their depravity. You know, the the best worshipers in the world are those who understand just how depraved they were because it leads them to worship. A couple of things we need to recognize when it comes to our own depravity, uh, personally, nationally, and globally. I just want to let you know you can't escape it. And if you think you can move to a better town, as actually a lot of you did, you're from California, you moved here because you wanted to escape depravity. You remember that? And then you got here and you got on the highway and you recognize these people are just as depraved. You recognize that depravity, it's in you personally. As a matter of fact, King David says it this way in Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It didn't even start outside the womb. It began at conception. That in conception, our babies, your baby, my baby boy, was conceived in sin. From the moment of conception, that baby was not only born into a depraved world, but is part of the depraved world and adds to the depravity of our world. We can't escape from it just because we're babies, just because we're born. But it's not just us personally, although it is us personally, and there's personal culpability that we all need to accept and recognize. It doesn't stop there. It's in us nationally. 
We have a, a nationally depraved people. We as a people group are depraved nationally. Uh, and this isn't the L-shaped amen where, you know, that political party, they're depraved, or that political party. Depraved. Remember, we're all a part of the depraved reality of our nation. Psalm 2, in the first two verses of Psalm 2, says this, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. What is the reality of the nations of our world? They're against God, they're against God's will, and they're always plotting in vain, trying to get what they can get, and without ever acknowledging the existence of God and his will in our world. It's in us nationally. can't escape it. You can't move to another country. You can't move to Canada now because they live that way, don't they? You used to have thought they were nice neighbors. Now they're just as sinful and depraved as the country you live in. You're not going to go to Mexico because you know how depraved they are. What are we going to do? The reality is it doesn't matter where you go. We live in a depraved world. And it's not just nationally. It's, it's globally. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says this. Surely... In Ecclesiastes 7.20, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Hey, we can't find them anywhere. You can go wherever you want. You can go to the furthest reaches of society. You can go to the jungles of South America. You can go anywhere in the world. You can go to Antarctica for the three people who live there. And you're not going to find anyone who is righteous and who does good and who never sins. You feel the weight of that depravity? Like there is no hope which is the point of the gospel, that without the light of Christ, there is no hope. You can't find righteousness anywhere. You can't find hope anywhere. You can't find the goodness of God anywhere because no one is good, no one except for God. We've got to grasp the depths of not only our personal depravity, but the depravity of the whole world we live in. The darkness of sin, uh, the very sin that we saw on the screen initiated through the disobedience of Adam and Eve has just been consummated not only in their sin, but in the sin of our whole world. We see it every day as we look at our news, as we look at our own lives, as you look at the decisions that you make and the conflict you get in in your own home. You recognize just how depraved you really are. As a matter of fact, Jesus is preaching. He starts his preaching ministry in Capernaum, a very dark place. And you want to know how dark Capernaum is? Jot down this text, Matthew 11, starting there in verse 20. Just how bad is Capernaum? Well, in Matthew 11, Jesus begins pronouncing woes on cities, particularly the cities where he did most of his ministry, which were, in particular, uh, Capernaum, uh, Chorazin, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, This is what he says about Capernaum. It says in verse 20 that he began to denounce cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. It's like the light had come. People saw the light. They recognized their depravity, at least in, in some sense, as they look at the perfect son of God and the reality that they couldn't do any of those things. They recognized the works of Jesus, but they didn't repent. In verse 23, it specifically calls out Capernaum. And here's what it says. And you, Capernaum... Will you be exalted to heaven? Right? Will you be exalted? Are you going to be brought up into heaven? Are you going to be honored when I come back and receive my people? Because you repented once you saw the ministry and I called you to repentance and you turned from your sin? You will be brought low to Hades, is what it says. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. That's, that's a city that rings some bells, doesn't it? That's some cities that I remember that. If I think of the top bad cities in the Bible, the two that come to my mind are who? Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, those are, those are some bad places. I remember the stories that was going on in there. And Jesus says, Capernaum, if I would have preached this message in Sodom, they'd have repented and come to know me. You are worse than Sodom. But I tell you, in verse 24, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Think of the depravity that he found himself in as he was ministering there in Galilee in Capernaum. The darkest place that you can imagine, even from the lips of the Messiah. I don't think that you and I have escaped that. Can you imagine how we compare? Our culture and our society compares to Sodom or Capernaum. I mean, the very things that they were doing in little, we do in bulk. 
The very things that they were trying out are the very things that we institute in our culture and our society, and you don't escape it either. The things that we listen to, the things that we watched, wouldn't have even been entertained by some of the most sinful societies in our world. And that you and I recognize that the depravity of our own culture is seeped into our own lives. It will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you and for us. Do we have the bad news yet? Sufficiently? Are we sufficiently just soaked in the reality of our depravity that we live in? I can keep going, but I won't. See, the only way that you're going to receive salvation, the only way our culture is going to receive salvation, what I mean culture is, I mean the individuals who make up our culture, is to understand you have a need for salvation. And you see that through all of the book of Matthew, the people who get saved are the people who will receive him like children, is, is particularly what Jesus says. And it doesn't mean that our children have a, a, a particular, a special ability to receive salvation that an adult doesn't. Uh, children have a particular uh, understanding or lack thereof that they don't know at all and that they need the provisions of their parents and they recognize that they need help. I mean, how many times does your, your child say, I need help, pick me up, I can't walk, I'm tired? Open that cookie jar. I can't reach it. Help me with my homework. I can't do it. I mean, how many, how many times, if you have children in here, do you recognize that to be the truth? I mean, your children are every single day asking for help. It's the reality and the disposition that Jesus is talking about when it comes to being like a child. you got to recognize that you're helpless. You need to humble yourself, and you need to readily admit that you need help. That's what it means to be like a child when it comes to the gospel, that you recognize that you don't have all the answers. But for those who do recognize their depravity, those who recognize the depth of the sin that we live in, God gives us some wonderful news. Let's look at verse 16, the rest of verse 16, the second half of verse 16 there in Matthew 4. It says there, the people that are dwelling in darkness, well, they, remember who they are, they're the people in the region of Galilee, this place despised by the religious rulers and despised and forsaken by the own sin of the people who live there. These people, they have seen a great light for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them light has dawned. I shouldn't need to remind you too much in detail about the symbolic nature of darkness and light. We see this motif uh, in Scripture. We see it a lot uh, in the book of John. We see it throughout all of Scripture. And particularly here, we see Matthew taking from Isaiah and putting into the book of Matthew the reality that darkness is sin and destruction and that which leads to death and light is that which is of God and in Christ and what is necessary for you and I to come to a knowledge of salvation and respond to it. So this motif, this light and dark, should show us that the reality of the situation was complete utter darkness and despair and Christ has come to bring, to bring what only the Son of God could and that is light and life. Because in the text, in Isaiah, we understand that he's promised today, Isaiah did, when God would deliver the people of this forsaken land. Can you imagine, uh, as bad as the depravity we're living in, you're in there, and you're during the time of the Assyrian exile, and imagine how dark it is. If you're a mom, your children are probably dead. Your husband has either been killed or taken somewhere else, separated from you. Uh, you no longer have a center of worship. You no longer can connect with the God that you serve or the family that you raised. Imagine the depravity. And not only that, you then have the culture of the Assyrians that come in, and you no longer have your own culture and your own lifestyle. You live theirs. Okay, imagine the depravity. Imagine the despair and sorrow you're going to have in that situation. Now, once you recognize that, now listen to the promise. Isaiah promised there's going to be a day where God's going to come and he's going to send his, his Messiah and he's going to deliver the people of this forsaken land. That's some hope, isn't it? When you lived in that situation, you're like, God, come. Lord Jesus, come. Because I can't wait to be delivered from this forsaken land. There's coming a time where the Lord's anointed one, where his Messiah is going to bring light to shine in the darkest places. And the people would finally at last see the answers to their problems through the Messiah to come. It shouldn't take you much to compare Capernaum, Sodom, to the culture that we live in today. Just as dark, probably darker, and to recognize that the gospel of Jesus shines as a light in this culture just like it did in that culture. 
The good news is for people to recognize the depravity that they live in, the darkness that is, that is blatant and obvious in our culture. There's a lot of you going to be going to watch the Super Bowl today. Nothing against watching the Super Bowl, but there's going to be something that goes on in halftime, and you're going to see a lot of depravity. What do you do? You got to recognize that this isn't something you're going to escape. You need to recognize that Jesus came for those people too. Jesus came for us people too. That Jesus shines in the darkest places in our own culture, and he gives life to even the most sinful people simply for the salvation of their souls, to do what they themselves couldn't do. Which brings me to this pre point that Jesus didn't come to point us to the light. I need you to understand that. Right? Jesus didn't come to point us to the light. He didn't come to say, hey, I'm going to tell you, show you how to live a perfect life, and I'm going to show you where to go to get it. That isn't, that isn't what Jesus did, and that's not who he is. He didn't just give us a way to the light. He didn't say, I'm going to walk the path, and if you follow me, I'm going to get you to the light. That isn't the life and ministry of Jesus. That is not at all what he did, and we can't confuse that. Because if we confuse that, and we think that Jesus shows us the way to the light, or, or Jesus points us to the light, we miss the whole point that he is the light. We miss the point that he isn't directing us to another place to go. He's directing us to himself. And that's what's important, especially when you want to respond to the gospel. You can't just respond to what Christ did. You have to respond to Christ. You understand there's a difference. I'm not just responding to the acts of Christ. I'm responding to Christ. Of course, the elements of the things that Christ did to be our substitutionary atoning atonement is very important, and you can't miss those things. That's why we can trust in the person of Christ, because of what he did. But I'm not trusting in what he did. I'm trusting in him because of what he did. And I have to remember that. They didn't just point us to the light. He didn't just give us a way to the light. He is the light. See, the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that we read in the scripture, isn't a self-help map to salvation, which is how so many people see Jesus. And when you see Jesus that way, you see the benefits of Jesus, and sometimes you miss the person of Jesus. And you can't miss the person of Jesus in salvation, because if you miss the person, you miss salvation. Because salvation is found in no one else Do you hear that? It's not that salvation is found in the acts of Jesus, not salvation is found in the things that Jesus did, but salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. Uh, I just want you to understand that because we we can. You may may think it's splitting hairs, but the reality is, is like if you're a Christian in here and you understand penal substitutionary atonement, the the ministry of Christ, the work of Christ on the cross, you're going to look at that and you're going to say, Okay, okay, I get it, but I, you, can, you, yeah, you can. You can believe that and still be saved. Uh, you can believe that the work of Christ saves you, but you keep taking that down the road to its inevitable end. What are you going to find? We're going to find that it's about the things of Christ and not about Christ. Then your life becomes about things and not becomes about Christ. It becomes about what Christ can do and not who he is. And you must understand that salvation is all about Christ. See, the gospel of Jesus is his life, is his death, is his resurrection, it's his triumph over sin and darkness, and you can't separate that from the person, and that's all we're trying to say. Do not separate the gospel from the person of Jesus Christ. I don't get saved through trusting in things, I get saved through trusting in Christ, and I can have confidence in that because of what he has done for sure. And really, I want you to write it down this way in point number two. You need to behold the answer to your depravity. You need to behold the answer. This is what was going on even as Matthew is writing uh, his gospel. The people there, behold, they have seen a great light. Those dwelling in the region, the shadow of death, on them light has dawned. Behold, there is the light of Christ that saves people. Remember, the Galilee was this region where religious leaders would comment, God could save those people. God could save anybody. You know people like that? Like, if God could save that person, he can save anybody. You look in the mirror, and you need to point at the mirror and say, if God can save that person, he can save anybody. It's the reality that they lived in there in the region of Galilee. It's interesting to note, where did Jesus start his ministry? I love that, because he started his ministry in a place where only God could reach those people. Only God could save those people. A place wretched and forsaken by people, by religious leaders, by people who loved the Lord and said they loved the Lord, that place is where Jesus went. He went to a place that Jesus compared to Sodom. 
just to show that his light is a light that shines light on even the greatest depravity in our world. It's important for us to understand as we look and we behold the answer to our depravity uh, to recognize we do have a problem. I mean, you and I recognizing that there's an answer to our depravity without denying your need, while denying your need for Jesus. You recognize that? Like, yeah, you know, I, I know the world's bankrupt. So I don't have to look that far, but I, I, don't, I don't need an answer. Like, you cannot shirk the culpability of your own depravity by saying that you don't have it when it's very clear that we all do. It's, it'd, be like, it'd be like a cancer patient who gets diagnosed with cancer, but it's a very treatable. I mean, most treatable kind of cancer. And all they have to simply do is admit that they have it. Admit that they have it, and we can, you don't even have to go through chemo. We can give you some, we can give you some pills that take care of that. You, you, it's very minimum. And yet, he keeps denying it. He keeps rejecting that the truth is there, that it's objective in its nature, and it's total in its consequences. I mean, for you and I, it's recognizing that that's the same thing when it comes to our depravity, is, is we have a disease, most treatable kind, turns out, because of Christ, and that those who recognize it and go through treatment, the success rate is 100%. Imagine that. God is going to save 100% of the people that he has called to himself. God is going to save 100% of the people who turn from their sins and place their trust in him. This isn't a 90% success rate. This isn't a 50% success rate. This is God is going to save those who come to him 100% of the time. They just need to recognize that there's a problem. Right? That is the good news. But it's good news when you can recognize it and accept that you have a depraved nature, to, to accept that you're sinful and separated from a holy God. Now, I don't mean good news that you should now be just celebratory. Because I know in the Christian life you're going to do that and you should do that. But I'm not telling you to celebrate your bad diagnosis, you understand. You know, if I'm not going to look at somebody and say, you have cancer, but praise it. You're going to be healed. No, that's, that's not what it's about. You should mourn the fact that you're depraved. Right? You should mourn the fact that the outlook is grim apart from Christ. Mourn that. It should burden you when you recognize the depravity that you have been born into, that you live in, and that will be here until Christ comes back. By all means, mourn those things. That is sad. And you're going to live in that. Your body is going to decay in that area. I mean, your whole life is going to be like that. By all means, mourn about those kind of things. But don't mourn without hope. I mean, the, rec the reality is treatment doesn't remove the burden you recognize, of depravity. I mean, it's still there. Even when you're saved, it doesn't remove the reality that depravity exists among us. But it, what it does remove is it removes the consequence of your disease. And that's the good news. And you should be happy about that. Mourn over your depravity all you want. But rejoice over the fact that the treatment that is Christ removes the consequences of your depraved nature before a holy God. That's good news. Mourn the, mourn the depravity. Rejoice in a solution. How are we going to do that? We can mourn the depravity, rejoice in the solution. The first thing you got to do is you can't deny your depravity. Don't deny your depravity. Don't do it. You're depraved, admit it. I mean, the first thing you got to do is admit there's a problem. And in your own life, even at home, you're getting in a conflict with your spouse. And the first thing you can say in every one of your statements of conflict with your spouse is, I am a depraved human being. Can you imagine how well your conflict would go? If the first thing you both did is look at each other and said, I am depraved. And not look at the other person and say, you're depraved. Because you know that's true too. But you know just as much as that's true, it's true that you're depraved. So imagine. Admit. Don't deny it. I want you to confront the reality of your depravity. Some of us, when we see evidence of our depravity, we like to pick up the rug and scoot it under the rug and, and walk off like it didn't exist. You know, a spout of anger. Lustful intentions. Uh, language, right? The ungodliness that seeps out of your life sometimes, and you do it, and you're like, I gotta forget about that. Like, yes, that did not happen. Pretend like it didn't happen. No, no, no. Confront the reality of your depravity. It's there, it's real. You gotta recognize it's real. You can't shirk it off. You can't say that it doesn't exist. And then you need to recognize the answer to your depravity. What I hope that we did, at least at the front end of this sermon, was to look at just how dark Capernaum was. Have you ever, you ever thought about how dark Capernaum was societally? I didn't. 
until I read this and I learned just how dark it was. And then we realized that's why Jesus was there. Right? That's why Jesus found himself right in the middle of Capernaum, because that's how bad that place was. Well, the principle is still the same in your own life. Uh, you recognize just how much Jesus is needed there and here when you recognize just how depraved and dark you are. And if you keep sweeping under the rug your own depravity, you can forget often just how bad Jesus needs to be there and Jesus needs to be here. And when you are reminded and you don't, you don't shirk it, you confront the reality of your depravity, and you recognize that Jesus has always been the answer to your depravity, it's much easier to keep him right here and not say, oh, he's something I needed before. But now that I'm saved, uh, he, he's, I'm saved. I don't have to worry about it. No, no, no. When you recognize your depravity, you recognize the answer to your depravity, and you don't sweep it under the rug, you're reminded every day just how much you need the answer to the depraved nature of your own sin. So what's left? What's left is someone who knows their depravity, someone who knows that Jesus is the answer? Response, just to respond. Look, look, look at the rest of this text, verse 17. It says, from that time, which you should underline that, that from that time, because that's significant in the literary makeup of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, because it's significant, because it's a time in the Gospel of Matthew where Matthew is decisively changing the tone and the direction of the ministry of Jesus. You see it here once, and it's initiating the preaching ministry of Jesus. Did you notice before this in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus didn't say much? He didn't preach. He quoted some scripture to Satan. I don't know, I didn't do anything. It was really more passive. He received baptism. He received temptation. He was driven out into the wilderness. He, he took a passive role up until this point. But you're going to notice at this exact point, he begins taking a very active role in the preaching ministry of the gospel and of the kingdom. And so here, from that time, it's significant because he does it here, and he does it another time in Matthew 16, 21. And what's interesting in Matthew 16, 21 is it's transitioning from that preaching ministry, then he's transitioning to his time preparing the disciples for his crucifixion. Now, is there some teaching in there? Yeah, after chapter 16, there is. But the bulk of that time that he spends after that in chapter 16 on to Matthew 28 is him preparing the disciples for his departure and for their preparation to take the mantle and go build the church. And so from that time shows you a decisive um, move from what has happened before to something right now is about to change everything. And as a matter of fact, you see that because there in verse 17, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach. So he wasn't doing that before. And he begins preaching and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now Jesus is taking a very active role in the ministry that he has been placed on earth to do. Jesus began preaching in this region of Galilee, and he's basically saying this, admit you're depraved and turn to me. That's what he's saying. Admit that you're depraved, admit that you're sinful, admit that you need to be like a child and you need help, and turn to me because the kingdom has arrived. The kingdom is here. It's not very, very difficult to take the principle and apply it to our life, is it? You're depraved. I'm depraved. Jesus has come for all of us to, to admit that we're depraved and turn, repent. That's what the word metanoia means, to repent. A change of mind and a change of my life. To recognize that from here to here to here to here, my life is going to be different because I've repented and I'm turning to Christ. But if we're going to do that, we've got to admit that we need a doctor. Right? If you're sick, you've got to admit that you need help. If you need help, you need to go to a doctor. It's exactly what Jesus says in Luke 5, isn't it? Luke 5, 30 through 32. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were grumbling at the disciples of Jesus, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well need no need of a physician. That's profound, isn't it? Very simple, as a matter of fact. If you're not sick, you don't need a doctor. So where is Jesus going? To the sick. Remember, you've got to recognize that because you see Jesus healing a lot of sicknesses because he's proving that he is the ultimate healer. And he is proving that he ultimately did not come to heal our physical condition. He came to heal our spiritual condition which at the end of the day is going to heal our physical dispositions because what is it going to do? Everyone's going to perish. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that it's appointed once for man to die and then comes judgment. We're all going to have a physical healing because of Christ and it's going to be at the resurrection. It's going to be at the glorification of our bodies and that's the reality that we have. And Jesus said, I have come 
to heal those who need a physician. And that's what he says. I didn't come to heal the people who aren't sick. Those who aren't sick, they have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call righteous, but for sinners to repent. He said, I've come for everyone who would recognize or depraved in their sinners that they would repent. I'm here to call them to that repentance. Brings me to point number three. You need to recognize the need to repent and trust in Jesus. To repent and trust in Jesus. That's his, that's his call. That's his, the response that he is required of each and every person who is depraved and recognizes that they are sinful and separated from God, that they need to repent and trust in Christ. That they need to turn from their sin and, and have faith in Christ for their salvation. As a matter of fact, that's what Mark 1 says. Mark 1 in the same uh, the same scene, we have Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, the same scene just recorded in the book of Mark, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, and he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the, the message for all time, for Christians, for the church, for God, is that people would repent and believe in Christ for the salvation of their souls. We talked over and over again that salvation comes to those who recognize their need for it, that see Christ as a solution for it and respond to his offer of grace. And don't you see that in the New Testament? I mean, who are the people saved in the New Testament? You're doing your daily Bible reading, you're finishing up Matthew. Wasn't it interesting that over and over and over again, it was the people who were down and out, the people who were blind, the people who were lame, the people who didn't have a chance? It wasn't very hard for them to recognize they needed help because it was very clear to them every single day when they got up that they were impaired and unable to provide for themselves. But over and over again, it was the rich young ruler, wasn't it? It was the religious leaders who said, no, we got this. I know enough. I have enough. I don't need what you're selling. Those are the people that didn't get saved. It was never the prideful, the arrogant, the self-righteous. They never received salvation. Listen to the simple words of one sinner and someone who was ready to receive Christ in John chapter 9. This man was born blind. And he was born blind. Uh, and there was, a, there was a whole long pericope on this that the Pharisees were trying to figure out what was going on and trying to condemn Jesus for doing something. And they tried to pint the blind man against Jesus. And uh, they called the blind man a second time. And they said, give glory to God, man. We know that Jesus is a sinner. You may be healed, but you've got to recognize it had nothing to do with him. You got to separate yourself from that man. And this is what that blind man said. He didn't know a lot, couldn't read. Most people at that time didn't read anyway. He just had some basic knowledge. That's what he says. Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. You realize that? The profundity of that? That he says, listen, you can debate all you want about all the things to debate about in our culture, but what I do know is the power of Jesus to heal and to save. And you guys can debate about him all you want, his righteousness. But I'm going to tell you something he did in my life. I was blind, and now I see. I was a sinner, and now I'm saved by grace. I was unregenerate, depraved in my mind and my heart, and now I'm regenerate. And now I have the Spirit of Christ in me. I'm a new creation. The new has come. Behold, the old has passed away. See, that's the gospel. And for you and for me... What we've got to do is we've got to look and understand one thing in particular. The gospel is an offense. It's a stumbling block. Okay, that's fine. But you know what it is to those who are being saved? A fragrance of life to life. That's what scripture teaches. And although it may be difficult and although it may be hard and there may be mourning in the lives of people that we t teach the gospel to, the reality is it's the only way to life. It's the only way to the healing of the degenerate lives that we have and the depravity that we find ourselves in is that we would simply preach the gospel and call people to repent and place their trust in Christ. People don't like it. We don't like the word repent. We've taken it out of the gospel in so many places. But what you're going to see even in this text as you already did and what you're going to see in your application questions this week is Jesus called people to repent all the time. It was part of the regular vocabulary of any gospel presentation that you need to turn from your sin and you place your trust in Christ. Let us be bold to do that this week. Let us, even in our own life, recognize our need to repent daily, even as we're Christians, to recognize we've repented for our justification that we're saved, but there's still a need for us, even in our own life, to recognize our depravity. It should lead us to worship. 
it would lead us to our own repentance daily and, and lead us in righteousness as we recognize just how depraved we are and how much we need the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as a church. God, my prayer uh, for this sermon is that it hit the mark. It did exactly what you desired that it would uh, from the time that it was superintended through the Apostle Matthew, that it's still preaching the exact same message that it was always supposed to, and that we would recognize that even in the darkest places, you shine bright, even in the most deplorable places where the most depraved groups of people exist, it is not too dark for the gospel to shine bright. My prayer for us is that that truth would embolden us and encourage us in our own faith to recognize that there's no one here that is too sinful to be saved by the grace of God and there's no one who has sinned too much to receive the grace of Christ. But the grace of Christ is given to those who recognize that we're sinful, recognize that we're depraved and separated from you and that Christ has came to fix that separation. He's come to expiate our sins. He's come to be the substitute for our sin that we would put on our sin on him as he did on the cross and he would clothe us in the righteousness of Christ. I pray that that gives us hope and encouragement today. I pray that it gives us great joy and boldness to be ambassadors for Christ as Corinthians teaches us that we would be bold to call people to repentance and faith for the salvation of their souls. God, let us finish even now in worshiping you in song. Let us be reminded of our great need for you and our great need to teach people about you. And all God's church said, amen.